back to an epic episode of Robot Cantina. We've been having some fun trying to get our 1300 pound go-kart to go 50 miles per hour with the little 212 cc engine. Today we're going to hand build an engine from scratch and test it out in our street legal go-kart. Stick around and find out how fast we get the car to go. Before we get started I'd like to take a moment and thank everybody who has subscribed to this channel. My goal is to provide infotainment that is so enjoyable that you'll want to come back for more. Now a big part of what we do on this channel relates to small engines. Currently we're focused on the Predator series engines specifically because they're affordable and in addition they're easy to get performance parts for. I realize there are viewers who may not necessarily be interested in the minutia of engine building and that's fine. However we rely on the viewers to give us feedback so we can move in the right direction. Today's video is not intended to be a tutorial or guide, but rather an entertaining overview of how we assembled a ridiculously small engine to power our project car. As a bonus, there's a fair amount of detail. And if you could let us know in the comments section if you'd like more or less detail. Yeah, that would be great. And now on to the video. Okay, let's get started. Now as you can see, we're starting off with a bare engine block. This of course is the same type of engine we've been using throughout the video series. It's a 212cc Predator that can be picked up for $99 when it's on sale. The first thing we're going to do is close up the holes that were left in the block when the governor was removed. On the top of the block, we need to plug this hole with a quarter by 20 set screw. The quarter inch tap slots right into the block without pre-drilling. The idea here is to turn the tap down several turns but not all the way through the engine block. This will give the plug something to thread into but also stop it from going through the block. I'm coating the screw with Honda Bond. Believe it or not, this is the glue they use to put Honda motorcycle engines together. It's good stuff, but don't eat it. Now some people like to use Loctite and that's fine too. This hole is where the governor shaft was punched out of the engine block. Punching the shaft through the block is the fastest way to remove the governor shaft and gear. You can try just pulling the governor gear and leaving the shaft in place, but eh, it's extremely difficult and frustrating to do it that way. Just like before, the set screws coated with Honda Bond to seal and lock the screw in place. The last hole we need to plug is the hole that was left when we removed the low oil shutdown mechanism. I'm using a 3 8 bolt, washer, and nylon stop nut to plug the hole. I'll bet there's a metric nut and bolt that would fit this hole, but I ain't got one today. We're going to modify the engine to be able to use a pulse type fuel pump. Now a pulse type pump needs a source of pressure pulses in order to work properly. I like to pull the pulses directly from the crankcase, so we're going to need to drill a hole right here. The hole is sized for a 1 8 NPT tap. Tapping NPT threads in this thin aluminum case can be tricky. You see, NPT is a taper thread, and running the tap all the way through will make for a loose fit. It's best to only run the tap part way through, then test fit the nipple. This takes some practice. For this build we're going to be using the indestructible billet ARC connecting rod. A cool feature on this rod is this gizmo that scoops the oil up and forces it directly into the bearings. Stuff like this is what helps the rod survive in a harsh environment. The rod uses bearing inserts just like the ones in automotive engines and of course replacement bearings are available from ARC. When joining the rod with the piston, you want to make sure the arrow on the piston points down and the scoop on the rod also points down. I like to use a lot of assembly lube when building engines. I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but I never had an engine fail. If nothing else, the wrist pin definitely needs a little extra goo. Once the wrist pin is in, it needs to be secured with the circle clip. Now it takes a few seconds to do this, but on camera it takes forever. Alright, well I reckon it's time to put the piston in the engine, but first let's take a minute and talk about piston ring gap. You see, you always want to stagger the ring gaps, especially the top two compression rings. Then of course the oil rings as well. Staggering the ring gap helps maintain full compression and minimizes oil burning. 
piston ring compressor is a must-have tool for a job like this. Of course, I've already coated the inside surface with assembly lube, but you can also use oil. Lubricating the ring compressor prevents damage to the piston and the rings. The compressor should be tight enough to compress the rings, but loose enough to allow the piston to move when struck. The threads on the connecting rod bolts need to be lightly coated with motor oil before installing. You'll need an E10 socket to tighten the connecting rod bolts. Space inside the crankcase is limited and the only torque wrench that seems to fit is a quarter inch drive. Torquing the connecting rod bolts is an important step. If this is done incorrectly you can expect catastrophic engine failure. ARC recommends the bolts be torqued in 20 inch-pound increments until you reach the recommended torque of 170 inch-pounds. This takes a while to do, but you just can't avoid it. The cylinder head we're using is a cloned version of the Honda GX160 or GX200 head. This head helps raise the compression ratio due to its small combustion chamber. We're also outfitting the head with stainless steel valves and 18 pound valve springs. The heavier valve springs will eliminate valve flow at high RPM. Let's take a closer look at the combustion chamber. Here we can see the chamber on a stock Predator engine. All right, now the high compression head. The difference is impressive. However, keep in mind the high compression head uses smaller valves. It's a little bit disappointing, but I'm hoping this won't matter since we're trying to cap the engine speed at 5,000 RPM. The cylinder head gets torqued to 200 inch pounds and it's best to do this in several steps. True story, I reached out to dyno cams and explained that I was using a 212 cc engine to power my Honda Insight and what camshaft would they recommend. Of course I gave them some other specs, but believe it or not they actually responded and they recommended a Mod 2 camshaft. Sounds good to me, so that's what we're using. I have to hand it to dyno cams. They provide an incredible amount of camshaft grinds for the Predator engine. Of course, most of you know that when installing the camshaft, the timing marks have to line up. If you get this wrong, good luck, the engine will never run. Now we can install the side cover. I think most people would just snug the bolts up and be done, but that may actually cause some problems in the future. The side cover adds a lot of strength to the crankcase and needs to be torqued down to 200 inch pounds or about 17 foot-pounds. It seems like a lot, but that's the recommended torque setting. So now we're ready to set the valve lash. This is obviously an important step in setting up the engine. The concerns here are twofold. If the lash is not enough, you run the risk of burning a valve, not to mention losing a lot of power. If the lash is too much, well, you may find the engine to be difficult to start. Basically, too much lash will cause the decompression mechanism not to work, and pull starting the engine will be extremely difficult. The recommended lash on both valves is three thousandths of an inch, with the engine at room temperature. Let's take a closer look at the Makuni VM22 carburetor. This popular carburetor kit is available through multiple online retailers. This particular kit was sourced for about $55, and it's one of the more inexpensive kits available. This VM22 carburetor is allegedly a licensed copy of a real Makuni, but it does appear to be of decent quality. The kit comes with an anodized aluminum dopter and a high quality air filter. It also includes the nuts, bolts, and the gaskets. Over here we have the idle adjustment screw. Its purpose is fairly obvious. And on the bottom of the carburetor is the idle mixture screw. On a properly set up carburetor you would use this screw to fine tune the air fuel mixture at idle. Now these carburetors as supplied will not work on a 212cc Predator. I know it's a bit of a mystery why these carb kits are sold for the Predator engine but don't actually work on one. Anyway, making them work correctly isn't really hard so let's go over that. This is the main jet needle and it's adjustable. To adjust the needle you have to remove it from the throttle barrel and you can raise and lower the needle by moving the E-clip into a different slot. 
Now I like to start off by placing the needle in the center slot. The final position of the needle is something that varies depending on the altitude and engine modifications, and there's no universal position that will work on all engines, but the center seems to be the best place to start. With the needle set, the engine still won't run correctly. The next step is to replace the main jet with one that can supply the engine with enough fuel at full power. Again, there's no set value, however a modified engine with a shorty header exhaust will typically require a jet between 115 and 125. Keep in mind if you're running a stock muffler on your Predator engine, then this carburetor kit is absolutely pointless. So this is the main jet, and you can get a bag of these from size 88 to 150 for about $15. To change the jet, you'll need an 8mm or even a 5 16 wrench and a regular screwdriver. Replacing the jet's pretty easy, just unscrew it from the carburetor. For my setup, I'm starting off with a 120 jet, and I can fine tune it by raising or lowering the main jet needle. Now this is just a basic setup that'll get your engine to run, and it'll probably run pretty good, but keep in mind you may have to do some experimenting. The final engine assembly is straightforward, and at this point all I needed to do was torque down the flywheel, install the magneto ignition, and bolt on the engine covers. Normally I would dyno test the engine before putting it in the car, but this time around I figured I would do the final tuning while the engine is in the car, and then remove the engine and dyno test it. Sort of backwards, but I'm finding it's a lot easier to tune the engine under actual load conditions. The one thing I wanted to mention is the ARC flywheel. This is an extremely well made part, but unfortunately the cooling fins machined into this flywheel are just not aggressive enough to cool the engine under the load I'm running it at. The flywheel is probably fine for other applications though. The billet flywheel was replaced with a standard cast iron flywheel, and as most of you know by now, the cast iron flywheel has the potential to explode at high RPM, so it's going to be a little bit sketchy. Anyway, enough talk, let's see what this engine can do. I guess we have to take the old engine out first. Hmm. Now if you recall, in the last video this little engine got the car up to 46 miles an hour. It's been a good engine, but now it's gotta go. And now for the new one. Looks about the same, but this one's got the Makuni VM22 carburetor, high compression cylinder head, 18 pound valve springs, ARC billet connecting rod, Dino Cam's Mod 2 camshaft, and some parts were actually carried over from the older engine. It's got the 6 degree offset flywheel key, and that'll boost the ignition timing up to 28 degrees total advance, custom header exhaust with sport bike muffler, and to top it off, an Autolite AR3910X racing spark plug. Oh, and let's not forget the governor delete. The tiny fuel tank had to be moved in order to have clear access to the Makuni carburetor, so now we have a fuel pump. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what this thing can do, so let's roll. Once again we'll be using the Hillbilly Proving Grounds in rural Michigan. It's a bit cold today, but otherwise the conditions are the same as the previous tests. Let's
let's bring up the scoreboard for the country road course. Let's see, way back in episode 1 we managed to get the car to go 35 miles an hour. Now that's with the unmodified 212cc engine. We did a little tuning on the engine in episodes 3, 4, and 5, and as a result the car did really well, and the speed increased to 41 to 44 miles an hour. Today in episode 7, the hand-built engine did a solid 45 to 46 miles an hour. Let's look at the numbers from Boot Hill. In episode 1 we didn't do the Boot Hill challenge with the stock engine. At the time we weren't even sure the car would make it up the hill, so no data here. Now after the stage 1 modifications in episodes 3, 4, and 5, the car was able to march up the hill starting at 43 miles an hour at the base and dropping down to 28 miles an hour at the summit. In today's video the car performed amazingly well at Boot Hill. It starts off at the base doing 43 miles an hour and the speed dropped to a brisk 36 miles an hour at the summit. Not too shabby. Now over in the Badlands we can see the stock Predator engine could only propel the car up to 39 miles an hour. Now all things considered that's not too bad for a lawnmower engine. After the stage 1 modifications the top speed increased to 46 miles an hour, but we can do better. Of course just when I was about to hit 50 a bunch of <coughs> turkeys decided to cross the road. <laughs> it was the end of the day and we were losing sunlight so it was pretty much a wrap. It wasn't until two weeks later we were able to get back out to the hillbilly proving grounds and reshoot the Badlands high speed run. So here it is. So what about the drag strip times? All right, let's go ahead and put up the drag strip scoreboard. In episode one, the stock six and a half horsepower engine accelerated the Honda to 30 miles an hour in a lazy 25 seconds. After the stage one upgrade, we were able to shave two seconds off that time. In today's video, we went backwards a little bit. Now, how is that possible? Well, the simple answer is we shifted the power band with the Mod 2 camshaft. That's not to say anything bad about the camshaft because it's also responsible for getting the car to get past the 50 mile per hour barrier. Unfortunately, when it comes to camshafts, there is no perfect grind. All camshaft profiles are a compromise in one way or another. In our case, we traded off some low end power for better performance towards the top end. Overall, the engine performed really well. The new engine was a lot smoother. And when the engine was in the zone, I had a tough time keeping it below 5000 RPM. It actually runs a lot like a real Honda engine now. Mm, fascinating. So what did we learn? A lawnmower powered car will go 50 miles per hour. Choose wisely when you pick a camshaft. The right grind makes all the difference. <laughs> it's a lawnmower engine. <laughs> really? <laughs> Read number three. <laughs> and I'm out of here. Well, we met our 50 mile per hour goal, but we're not done yet. As a matter of fact, we're just getting started. We have a lot more videos in the works, including the 420 big block swap. We'll have to completely fabricate an all new engine cradle and transmission adopter. There'll be lots of grinding and welding, and I'll bring you guys along for the entire process. Now would be a great time to subscribe and click on the notification bell. And if you enjoyed the video, do me a favor and click on like. And let me know in the comment section if this video contained too much detail or not enough. This will really help me in future videos. And thanks for watching.